to when you look at the New Orleans Saints, we discussed Jameis Winston, and of course we did, right? Because everything does kind of start in and with him. But uh, let's assume that Jameis does his job uh, to an acceptable level. What are the other, who are the other characters that will decide the way this team goes? One of them, without a doubt, is one of the best players in the entire league, and that is Marshawn Lattimore. Now, on the rundown here, it says Marshawn Lattimore Elite. With a question mark. And uh, some would say the question mark is ridiculous. I get that. Like, remember when Jalen Ramsey was asked for his top five corners in the league not long ago? He had uh, Marshawn second on that list. Justin Jefferson had Marshawn second on that list right behind Jalen Ramsey. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy Fowler from ESPN did a poll of NFL executives where they had Marshawn Lattimore second on the list to Jalen Ramsey. So in a lot of these circles in the know, he has the respect, but it's not quite everywhere yet, right? You look at the Madden ratings, which, as Jake told you yesterday, people do care about in locker rooms and, you know, these ultra-competitive guys, you only get here if you really do care about these things that we could kind of hand-wave away as a normal person. Uh, but in Madden, he's six. He's only a 91. And what's interesting about this is if he dominates this year, you could see that thing become a 99 next year because he faces a murderer's row of wide receivers on the docket this season. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to rattle off these names. Uh, again, Nick Gunner is the one who pointed this out. Jake, listen to this lineup. So on the same schedule this year, he will face Justin Jefferson, DK Metcalf, Jamar Chase, DeAndre Hopkins, Devonte Adams, Cooper cup, Debo Samuel, Amari Cooper, you're lucky you're still on the list. Mike Evans, DJ Moore, and A.J. Brown. I mean, re- Jefferson, Metcalf, Chase, Hopkins, Devontae Adams, Cup, Samuel, and then Evans. I mean, Jake, that's like the top like six yeah. or seven in the league. I mean, you're literally going against everybody the best. And it's funny because the, the knock on him was always that he played down to competition. Well, he can't this year. And, and, and to be fair, he didn't really last year. Like, he was dominant last year, best year of his career. But unreal the amount of challenge that Marshawn Lattimore is going to uh, going to have against him this year, dude. Oh, absolutely it will be. But I feel like that's when he thrives. I feel like when he's got one of those big-time matchups, and, you know, the Mike Evans saga, that's uh, one of my favorite things to watch whenever they go huh. against each other. But that is something that... The great players, like when they're playing other greats, it's like, okay, which one are you going to choose? Are you going to choose to kind of disappear or are you going to choose to accept the challenge? And he's accepted it. And certainly he did a year ago because I was even like, is he top five last year kind of going into the season? He was like on that edge of maybe six, maybe seven. And he's firmly now in the top three, Yeah, in my opinion. That's what he did a year ago. And I have to imagine it's only going to go up for him this year because of the other defensive backs he has around him now. Now, I know that you lose a very top-tier safety, but with who you have coming, with May coming in, with Tyron coming in, with uh, Alante Taylor coming in and giving you something extra, yeah. and you still have Bradley Roby, you still have Paulson Adebo, who's going to be Played in well, year, one. year number two, so you've got to imagine his level of play is going to go up. I mean, think about... He's going to get more opportunities, talking about Marshawn Lattimore. He's going to get more opportunities, I think, with the ball thrown at him. Because last year was like, rookie, rookie, rookie. Like, let me look over yeah, there. Let me yeah, try to pick sure. on him. So, I think even the players around him are going to help him continue to get into that not only top tier, but maybe fight for that number one spot. It'll be interesting, man. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering to see what his stats will look like at the end of the year. And if they're worse than last year, I wonder if people will be willing to engage with the context of the lineup of receivers that he's facing. Because last year, the numbers were incredible. 18 pass breakups, three picks, a 57 passer rating when being targeted. And that was still with some very good receivers on that lineup card, right? So if those numbers are slightly worse, it'll be interesting because he could have actually had a better season in the context of who he was having to go against. Though he has shut down people like this before. I mean, he shut down Debo Samuel. I think Cooper Cup got like one catch or like 66 on him, mm-hmm. but maybe nothing outside of that. As Jake alluded to, we all know what he did against Mike Evans. Justin Jefferson called him the hardest cornerback in the league outside of, of Jalen Ramsey. So he, he has done it against some of these guys before. He's just going to have to do it against a higher volume than he ever has before. And uh, But if he does, then that's how you become all pro, right? And that's how you become the stuff of legend. And that's how in everybody's minds, including the Madden EA team, You become a guy who should be 95 and above and one of the top two corners in the entire NFL. I was trying to look up his 
Pro Football Focus grade while we were sit, sitting there talking. He came in at number 10 last year, and that's a little surprising. I expect him to continue to climb the charts there. Now, like Denzel Ward was 11. Denzel Ward is in that conversation of top five corner as well. So I do love well, pro what's football. What's a byproduct of them just be ha- having to go against the right. best guys? I, right? do, I do love pro football focus, but if I felt like there was one position that it's incredibly difficult to grade, it's probably defensive back Yeah, because – you know the coverage, but maybe you don't know the coverage, yeah, yeah, right? You know exactly, what I'm saying? Yes, there was yeah. a play last year, LSU, I forget which game it was, maybe Central Michigan, that it was a quarters call, and everyone on the field was playing quarters uh, outside of one player. He was playing was a quarter, 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 half. quarter, quarter, halves. I feel like and, we talked about that a lot. Yeah, well, I mean, and then, like, the player, the safety, I, I think it was Major Burns, everybody's just, like, hating on Major Burns. Yeah, like, we you were. can't do that. What we are you were. doing? Where are your eyes? Blah, blah, blah. We were. It's like, no, Major was actually in the right coverage. The corner was in the wrong coverage. And then, so, you're going to get, you know, if you're pro football focused, oh, Major Burns, X, 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 X. Yeah. It's like, no, actually, the corner should get the X because everyone else was doing their job. There was 10 guys doing cover four, and then there was one guy playing cover six. So, all that to say that, yeah, you, I mean, well, well, I love the PFF metrics. Um, sometimes the grades can be... In that one position, vague. for sure. Uh, yeah. Because, like, an offensive tackle, I can kind of tell. You're run blocking or you pass blocking. Yeah. You know, let me get your grade. You, there might be some little sometimes nuances. Sometimes on, like, some MAs, sure, on, like, sure. pass assignments. But still, not nearly as much as coverage assignments cornerback. Especially maybe with the defense like Dennis Allen's, where you're constantly uh, trying to disguise and move things all around and constantly adjust. So, big-time year coming up for Marshawn Lattimore. Big-time year for Dennis Allen, right? We talk about all the QBs around the league who have now been set up for success and are being put into these do-or-die situations. We just mentioned it. Jalen Hurts, Tua Tonga-Valoa, Jameis Winston. Um, Well, it's actually the same situation for Dennis Allen, right? I mean, he got the second chance that does not generally come. Not when your first chance was 8-28. and And, and, And even more so, Jake, generally, if you're being hired as an NFL coach, you're taking over a bad situation because the other guy got fired. How rare is it then that not only is your second chance, which almost never comes, uh, so not only do you get that chance, but it's in an infinitely more stable situation than what you had previously. And I think Luke Johnson did a really good job in The Advocate of, uh, of laying this out. But as Luke says, he now has the backing of a proven front office a roster literally stocked with young veteran pro bowlers and then like young talent behind it. Uh, you, you know, we, we, when we were discussing the, the the quarterback tier list yesterday, we got into a lot of kind of a nature versus nurture debate, right? And how much, like at what point does talent become irrelevant in relation to environment? How much can environment affect how good you actually are or, or not? Uh, and, and a lot of times yesterday, it kind of felt like everything in a lot of ways. Like, there are some teams where they're just not getting any help. Like, what wasn't it Derek Carr who, I think, out of any starting quarterback of the last decade, had the worst uh, defense and special teams? That's a man who's constantly been swimming upstream. Now he, too, looks like he may have a better situation finally deal. I mean, even last year, his coach gets fired in the middle of the season, right? And so environment means everything. Well, now Dennis Allen doesn't have that excuse. He can't use the Mark Davis's goofy-ass haircut or – the Raiders just being a joke of an organization because he is with one that now has what? I don't know about the stats after last year, but going in last year, if you looked at the last five years in NFL football, the Patriots and the Saints had the most wins in the NFL. So there is no excuse. You're expected to come out here and make the playoffs year one. And uh, I would uh, he should embrace that, right? It's better yeah. than taking over a bad situation. But make no mistake, this is a prove-it year for Dennis Allen. If he can't win with this team well, then he's never going to get another opportunity after this. Yeah, it'd be hard to imagine he would. And the Raiders in that time, it was just, it didn't really matter who the coach was. Y'all have heard me talk about that many, many times before. I mean, they were just every two years, like new coach, new coach, new coach. And the organization was so bad, you didn't have a lot of help. And so, okay, those are some built-in excuses. Was some of the things Dennis Allen trying to learn his way as a head coach? Probably. This situation, as you laid out, T, completely different. Like, you don't have any built-in excuses. The team has given you everything that you wanted. Like, think about how much money the Saints cleared and spent this offseason. What they've used in the draft as well, having multiple first-round picks. They have given you the keys to the Ferrari. Now it's your job 
to be able to use that Ferrari, stay on the road, and go win some football games. So, to me, you take over. It's kind of like w- this year in, in college football. There were so many blue blood jobs that were available, and that's what was so intriguing to us. Like, who's going to fall into one of these jobs? Well, Dennis Allen fell into maybe the best situation possible when you're taking yeah. over a new team. It's very true because, I mean, it's just so rare that NFL coaches just walk away of their own accord, uh, much less ones that have, like, really good rosters intact on both sides of the ball. That's exactly what we got. In that same boat, guys, I would actually throw in Pete Carmichael. And now Carmichael, we've seen what he can do as an OC, right? In 2012, Saints were uh, second in scoring, or excuse me, third in scoring, second in total offense, right? But he had Drew Brees in his prime. Um, and he had Sean Payton at least in some sort of ancillary fashion. Now, Breeze and Payton are completely gone. Kind of reminds me of Mike Denbrock talking about how he had to get away from Brian Kelly. He had to go to Cincinnati to prove some things to himself, to get a little more autonomy over his offense. Well, this is Pete Carmichael's chance to show just how valuable he can be and how valuable he is on his own merit as an NFL OC. So a lot of prove it. Um, on this New Orleans Saints team. We're talking about Jameis Winston, Dennis Allen, Pete Carmichael. And I like that because although there is a bit of fear kind of inherent to the unknown, um, the unknown and and the desire to prove it also carries with it immense motivation and ambition, right? And so these guys are now the masters of their own destiny and how we will discuss them and look upon them. And whether or not they will all be parts of the long-term Saints future, a lot of that is going to come down to this season. Very exciting stuff. Real quick, I know we uh, have to take a break. There was a hundred and you know hundred thirty something corners rated when I looked at the Marshawn Lattimore to find where he was rated on Pro Football Focus. Uh, you know how many fullbacks they rated? Eight, six. Oh no, dude! Oh no! <laughs> With the oh, let dude. me see who the top fullbacks are. What did Alex they, Armand do? Is he top five? Uh, no. no what? They, they only they only rated six fullbacks. Wait, they didn't even guys. rate Alex Arma? No. He scored a touchdown last year. Yeah, no. not Didn't get a vote. Didn't Damn, get a rating. Disrespect, dude. You should have got fourth? Uh, who did? You should? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> what? What? Who are the better fullbacks of the Give us. Who is the number one rated fullback in the NFL? Uh, The Ravens. And then you got C. What's Patrick? Uh, you don't know their names? Yeah. He's like a D lineman that converted. He's a big boy. Wow. He's a big fella. <laughs> oh. CJ Ham, I think, is the best Fullback, maybe, in the NFL. He came at number two from Minnesota. I've never heard of C.J. Hamm, but that's oh, an incredible he, fullback name. He is. He's not like a typical, like, you Don't know, 260-pound fullback, but he's got some he's got some juice to him. All right, uh, when we get back, we'll wrap up with a couple more Little Saints tidbits. I still do want to discuss this Kyler Murray situation as well. Uh, I think we got some insight into Tyron Matthews' number and uh, USFL player maybe make his way down to our to say, uh, more to be done. <laughs> 